Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking a bit about the America Bomber Project. The name here makes it pretty apparent what the project was, but for the short version, the America Bomber Project was from the German Ministry of Aviation during the Second World War. The plan was to build a long-range bomber for the Luftwaffe that would have the range to strike the American mainland from Germany or German territory and return in a single trip. The project has roots back in 1938, where Hermann Göring would say in a speech that he desired a bomber that could deliver a four and a half ton bomb load across the Atlantic to, quote, stuff the mouth of arrogance across the sea. The project would be informally discussed in the next four or so years until a project proposal would reach the desk of Göring on April 27, 1942. The plan called for this, using either Germany, France, or the Azore Islands off the coast of Portugal, the last of which would have been the most feasible, the bomber would fly across the Atlantic to the U.S. mainland, where it would strike any one of a potential 21 targets. The main focus of this project was to bomb New York City, but the targets went as far west as Vancouver, and as far south as North Carolina and Tennessee. If taking off from the Azore Islands, the minimum distance traveled would be roughly 4,500 miles, and if taking off from the westernmost point of France, it would be roughly 7,000 miles. For this endeavor, a multitude of different designs would be submitted, ranging from conventional bombers to experimental jet bombers and even early ICBMs. The plane we're focusing on today is a more conventional one, one that has quite a bit of mystery and debate surrounding it. An absolute mammoth of a bomber that allegedly actually made the flight to New York and back without anyone noticing. This is the Junkers Ju-390. The story of the Ju-390 begins somewhere between April 1942 and October 1943. Dates aren't exact here, but sometime in this time frame, the frame from another Junkers aircraft, the Ju-90, an airliner, would be modified to better fit a long-range bomber role. From the original four-engine design of the Ju-90, additional wing segments would be added so that two more engines, powering two more propellers, could fit on the wings. Now, with six BMW 801E engines, the Ju-390 would ideally be able to fly up to 314 miles an hour. Additionally, an extra 14 feet worth of fuselage was added as well. Basically, the first Ju-390 design here was a stretched-out version of the Ju-90. This design, dubbed the V-1, would eventually take to the skies for the first time on October 20th, 1943. The results of this flight were apparently good enough to warrant the order of 26 more Ju-390s. Now from here, the story of the Ju-390 starts to get a bit muddy, so I'll try to explain it the best I can. There was a second prototype, dubbed the V-2, and it was constructed sometime between 1943 and early 1945. This version of the Ju-390 used another Junkers plane, the Ju-290, as the basis for it, and the same wing and fuselage extensions would be performed. This time, because of the Ju-290 being larger than the Ju-90, the Ju-390 was even larger now being one of the largest bombers built during World War II. Measuring in at 112 feet 2 inches long and 165 feet 1 inch wide, it was larger than the U.S. B-29 Super Fortress by a good 13 feet in length and 24 feet in width. Additionally, with an estimated max takeoff weight of around 116,000 pounds, it would ideally be able to carry 30,000 pounds more than the B-29. While this version of the Ju-390 surely would have been able to carry a significant multi-ton payload, no estimated or maximum payload was ever listed or determined. It was initially believed that the V-2 would first fly just after the V-1 did in October 1943. 
From here, along with additional basic testing, either the V-1 or V-2 was believed to have made several long-range flights. Two flights were to have taken place in early 1944, sometime around January, with one traveling on a round trip to South Africa and the other on an infamous trip all the way to New York. On the New York flight, it was alleged that after taking off from France, the JU-390 took photographs of Long Island from around 12 miles off the coast, but these photographs have never been found or produced. It was then alleged to have flown above New York for a full hour before finally returning back to German territory. The third flight was alleged to have taken place sometime late in the war, around 1945, where it would have flown round trip to Japan via the Polar North. But the New York flight in particular, first reported on in Western media in November 1955 by William Green, would add a rather shocking twist to the history of World War II. Imagine a Nazi bomber flying over New York City. The Nazis just a small step away from attacking the U.S. mainland and devastating not only U.S. military structures but civilians as well. How close we must have been to disaster. Well, you might have noticed through my wording, but in all likelihood, the New York flight, and the other two flights for that matter, likely never happened. The author of the article that would come out in November 1955, William Green, likely got the information from British intelligence reports from August 1944, where the interrogation of German prisoners resulted in the New York flight information. However, no actual evidence or photos from the event could be produced to corroborate it, and even in his later years, Green himself would express doubt that the story that these prisoners told was even true. Then, in 1933, two authors by the name of Karl Kostler and Gunther Ott, in research for a book about the Junkers 89, 90, 290, and 390 planes, would find evidence that suggested that neither the V-1 or V-2 Ju-390 could have even done the New York flight. For the V-1, according to the logbook of V-1 test pilot Hans Panchers, the V-1 would have been in Prague, all the way over in Czechoslovakia from November 1943 to March 1944 meaning the V-1 wouldn't have been in France at all, let alone in France to take off on a trip to New York. Additionally, Kostler and Ott contend that as the V-1 was still in its early testing stages, it never would have been outfitted with enough fuel to make the flight, as those testing it would be concerned with its structural integrity and would be focusing more on how the plane handled. Is it possible that the V-1 made an unlisted detour to France where the test engineers decided to throw caution to the wind and fly to New York? I mean, sure, it is possible, and considering how much somebody like Hitler probably wanted revenge for strikes against German cities, it isn't completely out of the realm of possibility, but it is very unlikely. But what of the V-2? If the V-1, in all likelihood, didn't fly to New York, then perhaps the V-2 did. Well, about that. Despite earlier claims and beliefs that the V-2 was flying around the same time as the V-1 in October 1943, it's rather contentious whether or not the V-2 was actually built in the first place. There are a bunch of conflicting claims here, so let's go through them rather quickly. Kostler and Ott contend that the V-2 was completed, but in June 1944 instead of October 1943. Furthermore, they contend that it did fly, but only from September 1944 onwards. According to Heinrich Hertel, who was a chief designer at Junkers, the V-2 had never actually been completed in the first place. According to author Friedrich George, it was completed and flown sometime in February 1945. According to author Anthony L. K., the V-2 was built and was scrapped after July 1944, having never been flown. Finally, Hans Poncherz, the test pilot of the V-1, contends that only the V-1 ever took to the air. 
To put it mildly, a good deal of confusion revolves around the existence and potential flight of the V2, but factoring in all of their accounts and theories, it should be safe to say that the V2 wouldn't have been around or operational around the time of the alleged New York flight in January 1944. So, if the flight to New York did happen, then it certainly would to have been the V-1 plane and not the V-2 plane, and since the V-1 flight to New York more than likely did not happen and there is no actual evidence for it, then it should be safe to say that the story of the Ju-390 flying over to America is bogus. This then raises the question of where this story came from. Of course, it came from those German prisoners, but why did those German prisoners supposedly tell the story of the Ju-390 flying to New York? Were they simply mistaken, or is it something more than that? Considering that the Ju-390 was part of the America Bomber Project, I think this wasn't a simple mistake. You see, while a major aspect of the project would be to destroy U.S. military production capabilities and cause general chaos, there may have been a more strategic goal. Throughout the war, the U.S. had been shipping a great deal of aid to Britain and the Soviet Union and various allied countries, military aid that was hampering the Nazi war effort. So, if Nazi Germany managed to strike the U.S. homeland, this would surely cause panic and a severe response. Now, knowing that the mainland wasn't as safe as they thought, they would then have to commit a lot of resources to drastically improving the air defenses of the United States. This would, in effect, significantly reduce the resources they could ship over to Britain and the Soviet Union and other Allied forces. So, when these prisoners told the story of the New York bomber, this may have been a little last-ditch simple attempt to trick the Allies and the U.S., into thinking that they were incredibly vulnerable to German air attacks. Considering the state of the German war effort in mid to late 1944, where these statements were recorded and reported, it is likely that they just made up the story in a cheap effort to help the German war effort. Of course, this little story didn't really change anything, and the war continued as it was. As for the Ju-390, the project would be cancelled along with the rest of the prospective America bombers sometime around July 1944 or later. Focus would shift from these rather costly, massive projects to the Emergency Fighter Program for the defense of Germany. In the end, the Ju-390 proved to just be too costly for the situation Germany found itself in in 1944. Like a great deal of experimental German projects, their dire situation at the end of the war necessitated the conservation of vital resources and a shift into emergency defensive projects. Such was the fate of many a interesting and bizarre German projects. Alright, and on that note, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I do plan on covering some of the other America Bomber projects sometime in the future, so do be on the lookout for those. Some pretty interesting ideas and designs came out of that project, so be sure to check out those videos whenever I decide to make them. But I hope you enjoyed this video at least, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!